Excellent. So let's get started. Yeah. So I, I'm sorry I couldn't make it in person. Yeah, it was a crazy week and I got a, a cough and I'm still uh, not fully recovered. But you know, I'm under playing with my friends. So hopefully, my coughing will stop for for this talk. Uh, yeah. So, so I'm going to be talking about shortcuts in quantum annealing. Uh, uh, so let me just get started and uh, you know acknowledge my collaborators, my group in, in Luxembourg. Uh, so it's a few uh, three postdocs and three PhD students. Master of the student just left, and uh, I work uh, closely with uh, Aurelia Senu, who is the, down the corridor uh, and has a different group on quantum dynamics and control. Yeah. So for those who don't know me, so you, you know, but I will be talking about quantum annealing and optimization in this talk. But we will also cover other kind of research topics such as quantum metrology, information geometry, quantum chaos, integrability, our cats, and so on. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so yes. Okay. So. There was this, this beautiful Inca uh, INQA uh, seminar but series that has been organized, so I gave a talk there recently. I thought that in any case, I, I would summarize a bit of the findings there, uh, which connect with the talk of Andrew uh, yesterday. And then I will uh, uh, change gears a bit and uh, address how to how to do shortcuts in quantum annealing by two different proposals, yes. Uh, so much of the intuition I have come actually from something that is not quite quantum annealing, but is the crossing of a phase transition. And you may argue that this can be misleading in quantum annealing, but let me just tell you a bit the, the idea. You know, and this is uh, um, uh, essentially what is behind is the kibel surek mechanism that describes the dynamics of a continuous phase transition when you drive a system in finite time from a high symmetry phase to a broken symmetry phase. Um, and you know, it, it, it works even in the classical case where it was first introduced. Uh, the idea is, you, you know, you break symmetry, say in a ferromagnet, uh, you go from a, from a magnetic phase to a ferromagnetic phase, you get domains in the broken symmetry phase, uh, the interface, you get topological defects here, domain walls, and you are asking questions such as how does the size of the domains depend on the cooling time, on the, on the quench time, on the annealing time, or, you know, what's the typical density of, of topological defects. And this is something that, you know, Tom Kibel in cosmology started to consider in the 70s, uh, he also realized that there were connections with condensed matter, and these were found and elaborate, elaborated by Surek. Uh, the key prediction of this kibel surek mechanism is that the uh, average domain size scales with the quench time as a universal power law of, uh, fixed by the critical exponents of the phase transition uh, of the universality class to, to which the phase transition belongs to. Uh, this was early on, it was all classical, and then there were beautiful works in 2005. Uh, for very simple systems, one dimensional transverse field is in model uh, that you know has a phase transition between a paramagnetic phase when G is large to a ferromagnetic phase, and uh, you know can be mapped to quasi uh, free fermion. So you know it's, it's essentially a free system and can be uh, in Fourier space uh, can be written in terms of the occupation number of the modes. And uh, here, if we want to uh, test the kibel surek mechanism, what we uh, need is an operator which counts the number of kinks. This is just a one-dimensional chain. It has a spin up, a spin down. Uh, uh, so uh, this, this operator counts the number of, 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 of uh, misalignments in the ferromagnetic phase between adjacent domains. And it does have also a very simple form in, in Fourier space, which is uh, the sum of the occupation numbers in its mode. Yeah? So with, with this setting in 2005, there were four beautiful works which uh, saw that actually the kibel surek mechanism holds in the quantum domain. And in particular, for this uh, universality class of the uh, transverse field, is the model uh, that predicted a scaling of, uh, with the square root of the quench time, which is what you get uh, from the kibel surek prediction when mu and self, the critical exponents, are both equal to 1. Yeah? So, right, so, so uh, this has been generalized to other quantum systems and classical systems in different dimensionalities. And uh, by now, we, we have high confidence on the broad validity of the kibel surek mechanism, even if there is no kind of a, a, a universal proof. Yeah? Uh, it, it seems to be very hard you know, uh, to, to, to provide a general proof. So well, it's a accumulated evidence, both from experiments and, and theory. Uh, so you know, what is nice is that you know, the ideas early introduced in cosmology moved to kind of condensed matter, then to quantum simulation, and finally to the wave, as you heard yesterday. So I, I want to say something a bit beyond Kibel Surek, and this is also, I guess it was discussed yesterday to some extent, 
is uh, uh, the, the probability of looking at the full distribution of the number of topological defects, the king number distribution. Uh, so this is based on work I did in 2018. And um, for the sake of presentation, let me consider the same setting. So yes, the transverse field is in model. And instead of looking at the average number of the king operator, I'm going to look at its eigenvalue statistics. So the probability to observe a given eigenvalue when uh, you know, and, and that, so this is the, the king number distribution, yes. And uh, so we were able to find it in close form. And what is nice is that, uh, you know, you can do a good accuracy, describe it as a normal Gaussian distribution, which is centered at the Kibel Schurek prediction. And it has a variance that is also linear on the, uh, is proportional to the mean, to the mean number of kings. Uh, so, you know, this, this happens, you know, these are the solid lines and they, fit very well the histograms that we get uh, for, through a numerically exact calculation for the one-dimensional transfer Felici model. Now, of course, we will go very slowly. We get into the regime where we have a uh, perfect adiabaticity with no kinks at all under uh, this Gaussian approximation breakdown, which is, you know, the, the histograms becomes uh, asymmetric, and, and this mainly works uh, when the uh, excitation uh, of the number of kinks is high. Right, so, so you know, what, what, what can we do beyond the Kippel Schreck mechanism? So the Kippel Schreck mechanism predicts that the mean number of excitations scales as a power law. But what we can show is that uh, not only the mean number, but also the variance, the third center moment, and any cumulant follows the, uh, is proportional to the mean and therefore follows the same power law uh, predicted by the Kippel Schreck mechanism. So this is what, what we call beyond Kippel Schreck, is the fact that we can uh, put the uh, full counting statistics of topological defects and so that all cumulants scale uh, with the same universal power law. A prediction that does not follow from kibel schurek mechanism, you need additional ingredients, both in the classical and quantum case. Uh, you know, what, how, you know like, uh, an interesting test, for instance, is if you plot these cumulants as function of the quench time, you see the, in the double logarithmic scale, you see these power laws. They are all uh, uh, have the same slope, so then it means the, you know, the same scaling with the quench time. But there are uh, numerical factors of, you know, they are not all, all falling on top of each other, but the first cumulant is higher than the second cumulant, higher than the third. So the, the distribution is not Poissonian, it, it, it's what is called a Poisson binomial distribution. Okay, so the, you know, this was the theory and uh, what we did in the first work that perhaps was mentioned yesterday uh, in, the, in a collaboration with a group of Hidetoshi Nishimori and Daniel Lida and Sei Suzuki was to uh, test this in, in D wave. And uh, uh, we uh, embedded the one-dimensional transverse field model in two different machines. And um, there we collected data for the first of all, just for the density of kings as a function of the annealing time. And what was interesting there is that the, uh, when we make power low fits with the quench time, we could not match the theory of the system in isolation. So we were forced to conclude that uh, uh, in that time scales, uh, which were here up to 100 microseconds, uh, the wave behaves like a quantum open system uh, and, and a very particular kind of open quantum system where the phase transition between a paramagnet and a paramagnet is not destroyed, but simply the critical exponents are renormalized. And uh, what, you know, indeed we, we found well, consistent power of exponents in one of the machines 0.2, in another machine 0 0.3, 0 0.34. Uh, so clearly different from one half which is the value for the isolated transverse release model. And we have a numerical theory uh, uh, based on essentially a, on a spin boson generalization of the spin boson model, which, which makes uh, this prediction, yes? Uh, so this, this is a very uh, quick summary of, 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 of our findings, you know, but essentially uh, for quantum annealing, you may be interested in uh, D-Way being an isolated system, but from the point of view of the statistical physics, this was the first test of kibel schurek mechanism in an open quantum system. And as such, I think it has long standing value in, in, in the understanding of, of phase transitions in open systems. Now, another thing, you know, would be, uh, the, the possibility to also probe the full counting statistics in D-Way, which uh, is very unique from the point of view of the very high sampling statistics, the very good uh, you know, you, you can run many, many experiments in a relatively short time. Uh, this allows us to prove uh, the mean, variance, and third cumulant uh, scaling with the wind time 
and when you see the, the, the confirmation of the numerics I saw you before for the theory, so you see here, but this is data collected from D-Wave, beautifully scaling with the same power law uh, for different cumulants. Yes. So, you know, so, so I don't go much into the details, as I mentioned, there's this online uh, Inca uh, seminar, uh, which is recorded where I discuss this in more detail, uh, you know, um, uh, perhaps uh, you, you heard some of this yesterday as well. Good, so uh, but this was also the first test of kibel um, of, 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 of physics beyond kibel surek mechanism. Um, uh, not, it so happens that it was now many of the open quantum system, but even uh, it's the first non-trivial test of physics beyond kibel surek in any kind of platform. Yeah. Good, and uh, I'm sure you, you saw the, the beautiful results. Uh, from the wave, where they essentially operated at the shorter, uh, much shorter uh, annealing times, and then they defined results which were consistent with the isolated uh, transverse field leasing model. They also collected the distribution of the number of kinks and the cumulants, and now they found beautiful power laws, uh, very much as we did at longer times, but now the power law exponents are consistent with those of the isolated. Uh, transverse field quantum missing model instead of the open uh, transverse field quantum missing model. Yeah. Okay, so this was with this I close the summary of, of, of these results, and uh, now I move uh, to the to the part of which was advertised, which is actually that of uh, shortcuts to electricity in, in quantum annealing. So you know shortcuts for those of you who uh, have not heard about them, uh, it's a generic set of tools and techniques that have been introduced. Uh, to engineer uh, protocols that are alternative to uh, adiabatic protocols and uh, they, they are equally efficient in preparing a, a target state so they, they, they are useful for uh, uh, state preparation uh, and they replace adiabatic protocols in the sense that they don't require slow driving. So you can go fast, you will go non-adiabatically, create excitations but they still find, uh, reach the same target state as in an adiabatic evolution. So uh, there are different techniques you know, that have been applied for optimal control, strongly correlated systems, quantum computing, and so on. Um, I'm going to first introduce a technique which is really um, um, heuristics, yeah? um, based on Kibel Surek, and then I will move to a technique which is, uh, both of them are universal, but they work in a very different way. And the first one is very intuitive, it's very classical, it's, it's like, uh, it's, it's based on the idea that if you drive a system locally, uh, that can help you to suppress excitation formation. So like this, this arc is, is also, you know, it's just exciting, you know, only locally the system, but not, you know, for systems, parts of the system which are far away may, may not be so excited uh, about the, the, the driving. Yeah, so the, this idea of, of local driving um, has a long history. In the context of phase transitions, we you know, we we'll brought uh, a review with uh, Tom Kibel and Wojciech Surek. Actually, this is the only work they have together. It was a pleasure for me to, to be able to uh, be part of it. Uh, but the idea is very uh, intuitive. You know, that you, 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 ha you have a phase transition. If it happens everywhere at once, uh, it, it, you, you excite the system much more than if you drive it locally and then have a, well you know, a, a causal front that spreads out throughout the system. So how can we engineer for this in a given spin Hamiltonian? So let me go back to the model of the one-dimensional leasing chain. The key is to make either the magnetic field or the interactions spatially dependent. So it doesn't matter which one I make spatially dependent. Here, for the sake of illustration, imagine that my ferromagnetic couplings uh, do have uh, this dependence with the lattice index. So they are maximum, uh, they take maximum value at the center of the chain and then they decrease sideways as an inverted parabola. And let's assume for, you know, just for the sake of illustration that the magnetic field is homogeneous. So I drive the system homogeneous uh, with a homogeneous field, but my system is, is, uh, is, is inhomogeneous. Yes? It has uh, spatially dependent couplings. I could do the opposite. I could have whichever spin Hamiltonian I have, maybe a spin glass or something like this, and I can try to anneal it with a, with a magnetic field which is n not homogeneous, but it has some spatial profile. And, um, right, so, so, in, in, so to connect with the kibel surek theory, what we do is to drive, you know, uh, the magnetic field at a well-defined rate, uh, but we uh, modify the uh, ferromagnetic couplings in a kind of inverted parabola uh, uh, kind of shape. 
and we then cross the phase transition. So what you see is that the criticality will be reached first at the center of the chain. So that's you know so so it's not everywhere at once, but you, you first cross the phase transition locally at a given point, and then there is a critical front which starts to spread out sideways. Yes. Uh, so this is what brings the new physics. There's going to be a front at which the criticality is met locally, and this, this front is spatially moving with some bit controllable velocity. Uh, so we can formalize this. You can introduce the velocity of the front at which the phase transition is being reached locally, and you can compare it with the speed of sound. Uh, a given system will have effectively a speed of sound given by uh, roughly the thermodynamic coupling. Um, the modification of the kibble schurek mechanism for inhomogeneous systems is that the uh, formation of topological defects is restricted to the regions where the front velocity is faster than the speed of sound. You know, so if the front velocity is moving very quickly, then excitations are going to be created and topological defects will be formed. If the front velocity is moving very slowly, then there is a chance for the information to be propagated throughout the system before criticality, before the phase transition occurs, and this, see, this, this helps to grow a single domain uh, where and, and to suppress topological effects. Okay? So es essentially, we can see that uh, due to this causality uh, hands uh, effect, uh, in which we uh, require the front velocity to be larger than the speed of sound, topological defects may only be formed in a smaller region of the system, in a subpart of the system. In this case, for the inverted parabola, we engineer it in, in such a way. Defects can only be formed here, uh, where the uh, phase transition is effectively happening everywhere uh, in, in this region in the center of the chain, will happen everywhere at once. But as we move sideways, uh, the velocity of the uh, front will decrease uh, below the uh, sound velocity, and there will be no defects being formed uh, at the edges of the chain. So all defects will be only formed in the central region. Uh, this is what we call N-tilde. And uh, due to this effect, uh, essentially we have that the density of kinks and the local driving is the density of kinks and their global homogeneous driving suppressed by a factor which is the effective system size divided by the total system size. So we can see how efficient this technique is in suppressing defects. This local driving technique is just given by this ratio between the effective system size where defects, defect formation is allowed by causality uh, versus the total system size. We can do numerics to visualize this. So you know, we, we take a, a, a transverse field model and uh, we drive it locally uh, and we see this kind of density of defects. We drive it globally uh, without any spatial dependence, and the density of defects is higher. And so we provide a suppression of the density of defects for you know by a factor which can reach up to an order of magnitude uh, in in the regime where uh, we have inhomogeneous kibble schurek scaling. In this, uh, if you, if, even if you have a spatial inhomogeneity, if you go fast enough then you see that the behavior is the same as in the case of a homogeneous system. The power law is actually the same. So if you go very fast, uh, there is no difference uh, be between local driving and, in and, and global driving. But uh, you know, to have the uh, enhancement of the defect suppression due to causality, you need to have this interplay between the front velocity and, and the sound velocity. And here is where you have an important suppression of the density of kinks. Cool. So this is this is very universal. You know, I'm not using any particular feature of the system other than engineering a local driving. Yeah? So it's a general recipe. It's not uh, you know very rigorously uh, justified it's in the spirit of Kibble's work, but you know you can expect it to apply very broadly. Uh, you know, to, to, to all kind of systems. You know, from cold atoms, river gases, and superconducting qubits, and so on. Right. So you know. So the, so far, by the way, there's only an experiment on two-dimensional Bosch gases that have been uh, able to confirm this uh, enhanced suppression of the density of kinks with the quench time, uh, where you increase the power of exponent from one half to three half. Uh, so there, there's an experiment in both gases, but other than that, there are no experiments yet in quantum simulation. So you know, it's, not, it's something that could be checked in, in the way. Uh, so the, so uh, in particular, the Bosch gas experiment is essentially a mean field classical experiment, but in the way, we will we, we prove it in the quantum domain. And we extended this uh, a few years back, uh, you know, with Mark Rams and Masoud Moseni at Google uh, to 
disorder spin systems, and we saw that it holds more, more generally. I don't go into the details, but let me yeah, say that yeah, there's a number of works we saw that this technique uh, is very of very broad applicability. All right, so I now want to move to cancer diabetes, right? So this is, uh, so yeah, so, so I presented uh, Kibel Surek and physics beyond Kibel Surek, and I told you how we can suppress defects by local driving. And now I want to introduce one last technique, one last approach to suppress defects based on counter diabetic driving. Yeah? And, uh, you know, this, this idea has been around, you know, we applied to, uh, this idea was introduced in 2002 uh, by, uh, as, a, as a control technique. We applied to many body systems in 2012, uh, and there's been beautiful progress ever since. So I'm going to provide a bit of a summary of, of what has happened there. Yeah? But again, we were motivated by how to uh, suppress uh, formation of excitations uh, early on in the context of given silicon phase transitions, but there's been progress towards annealing, competing, optimization, and so on. So let me introduce you the, the technique at a level which is uh, kind of one on one part mechanics, so everyone can understand it. You know, so the idea is we have a reference Hamiltonian, it's not, that depends on time. And for the time being, I'm going to assume that I can diagonalize it. Later on, we will remove this condition. But let me assume that I can write down the instantaneous eigenstates and uh, the eigenvalues. Yeah? And what the adiabatic theorem tells us is that if we drive this system very slowly, then the time dependent state just uh, follows adiabatically the instantaneous down states and simply pick up a phase which is a dynamical phase and a geometric phase. And what was asked in 2002, 2003 is, well, there exists a different Hamiltonian, uh, different from its node, for which the adiabatic approximation to its node becomes the exact solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Um, and the answer is always yes, and uh, you can always find this uh, Hamiltonian and split it into a reference Hamiltonian and a counter-diabatic control, H1. This is the guy that suppresses excitations and enforces adiabatic following to uh, the adiabatic approximation to its nodes, even when you go very fast and you are break, breaking the conditions of the adiabatic theorem. Yeah? So you, you, you are able to run a fast motion video of the adiabatic trajectory, uh, but uh, to do that you need to modify the system Hamiltonian and supplement it with some auxiliary uh, counter diabatic controls. Um, so we can write these counter diabatic controls in, in, in explicit form in terms of the instantaneous eigenstates of the reference Hamiltonian H0. And that tells you how horrible, how much of a beast this counter diabatic term is, because it couples essentially every eigenstate, every, every eigenstate with every other eigenstate. So this is, in principle, a highly non-local uh, operator in the energy eigenbasis. Yes, and just imagine that these operators are many body, so then uh, you, you see how, how tricky it is. Of course, you can also see how, uh, by construction, in the adiabatic, theory, in the adiabatic limits, uh, the, the norm of this operator, H1, goes to zero, because you know, this is precisely uh, the rate of change of your reference Hamiltonian with respect to all instantaneous maps. This is very small in the adiabatic theorem, and this is how uh, the, this, this construction of the counter diabatic gradient first appeared in the mathematical physics literature, not in 2002, but actually in 1950, when Kato, Yossi, uh, Yossi Kato was proving the, the adiabatic theorem. Yeah. It was only recognized as a, as a trick for quantum control in 2003, but the idea has been uh, back there for a while. Good, so you know, how does this counter-diabatic uh, term look for simple systems? Well, for, for a spin one half system, uh, it looks like a sigma-wide uh, term. You can uh, go to a unitarily equivalent frame, to a rotating frame, and change it into something which looks like sigma cell, which may be easier to implement. Um, for a harmonic oscillator, it really doesn't look so nice. It's a squeezing operator, sure. You go to a, a rotating frame, you can express it as a potential. Yeah? If you are thinking of transport of matter waves, then you need a term which is uh, a, a non you know, it's, it's a momentum operator, linear, linear in P, as you get into relativistic systems, but uh, not, not such a nice one, so you know, you need, you can go out to a rotating frame and express it in terms of position. So, you know, people early on in the uh, 2000s and were, were playing this trick of, for simple systems, find the counter diabetic frame, the counter diabetic term, realize that typically it's very difficult to implement, even in a simple system in the laboratory, 
and then go to a rotating frame where perhaps it was easier to implement. So that, well, that's the early, the early game that play, people play with shortcuts to adiabaticity. Now in 2012, we say, okay, let, let's apply to a, a, a system with a quantum phase transition. So I go back to my DR transverse Felicity model. I draw the phase transition between the paramagnet and the thermal magnet. And I realized that, uh, yes, I can construct exactly the counter variability term, but this is a, a, a this is a, this is not nice. And so this is, you know, it, I can write it in Fourier space, uh, uh, but, you know, for every mode, I have a sigma, uh, uh, sigma y, a poly y uh, operator acting on k mode. So the way you do this is by um, your ambient transformation and Fourier transform this standard techniques in integrable systems of quasi free permanence, but uh, those of you who are familiar with them uh, automatically recognize that uh, an operator which is local in K will be highly non local in real space. So, implementing this in a transverse Felicity model will require that you, you know, uh, all kind of nasty interactions like uh, one body, two body, three body, four body, five body, seven, six body, ten body, you know, n body, you know, n half body interactions. So, not, 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 you know, not something you want to to an experimentalist and say, hey, can you do this for me? Uh, you, you may be able to do it in Fourier space, but not in real space, it's very tricky. So we had realized uh, that this was an issue back then in, in the early paper, and what we proposed is, well, maybe we can just truncate the series, and we only include the first few modes, uh, you know, and so let's see how that works. Uh, so this is, you know, we, we, we consider the driving of the phase transition at a finite rate, we look at the density of excitation versus the quench rate, and we, you know, so if uh, we first consider, let's do nothing, then I have the kibel uh behavior, this is the power law. Then I only, uh, I use the truncation of the counter variability term with two body interactions. So what you see is you are able to suppress excitations at high rates, but at low rates, you effectively do nothing. In the annealing regime, if you want to suppress excitations, you need three body, four body, five body, seven body interactions. So, you know, if, you know if, you, if you have the luxury of being able to realize the counter variety term, then you completely kill the dependence on, on the annealing rate. So, you, you have a low number of excitations. You know, it should be zero, uh, in, you know, but, you know, numerically we have some threshold, uh, but you know, it should be essentially zero, yes? Uh, <coughs> however, um, if you only have access to two-fold interactions for, for the counter variety control, uh, the only difference you see that high rates, but not at the slow rates. So this was not not so good. Yeah? Uh, so that's more what, where we stopped. Uh, maybe one more thing is that we propose uh, making use of digital quantum simulation uh, to effectively realize these counter counter variety controls. And this is something that ten years later exploded, as we will see. Uh, right. So uh, you know there were further developments even at that time in 2013 by Kazutaka Takahashi, is now visiting the department and uh, Bogdan Dansky, Steve Campbell, and so on. Uh, so, so, so then there was a, an idea introduced by Klaus Molmer and Thomas Opatry. So they say, well, you know, uh, uh, imagine, you know, forget about this exact counter reality Hamiltonian. Assume that in my laboratory, I can only realize a set of control operators, L of K. And so at most, I can expand my counter reality, counter -reality control in this uh, set of available uh, controls in my lab. Yeah? So how well can I efficiently approximate the exact counter variety control in terms of the controls that I really have and I really can implement? So they, they propose this variational approach, you know, to, to uh, approximate the counter variety control. And, uh, you know, we also apply it to many body systems. Uh, your counter variety control now is written in the set of operators you can implement. And, uh, I guess the idea I just want to say is this provides a much more efficient suppression. Even just with two-fold interaction, we can provide suppressions of many orders of magnitude with respect to the uncontrolled case. So, you know, if you choose two-fold interactions smartly, uh, say, through this variational approach, you can already gain uh, a, 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 a huge suppression in the uh, number of uh, excitations. If you have the luxury of being able to implement three-fold interactions, then the suppression is uh, essentially total and you are already uh, reaching the adiabatic regime, uh, even even if without resorting to the exact counter adiabatic control. Uh, maybe not mathematically zero, but uh, de facto zero for any practical purpose. Okay, so this was a bit of progress. This was still in 2014. Um, 
let me skip this. So I put here a timeline, at least of the works that I found particularly inspiring. Yeah? So, so, okay, so the, we, in 2012, we did this exact result for skin systems that found horrible interactions. Then in 2014, there were ideas of using variational approaches uh, which will allow us to implement approximate the control, counter variability control uh, by in some increasing number way. I think 2016 was remarkable because you know, this, maybe there are other experiences for this one, but you know, there was a demonstration that uh, adiotic quantum computing can be done in a digitized form, you know, so it was in, in superconducting qubits. So this was one, one kick of motivation to say, well, you know, even uh, interactions which are a bit uh, crazy or, uh, you know, not typical interactions that appear in complex matter systems, we can still cope with them and, and uh, realize them in a digital uh, setting. So this was one important thing that happened in 2016. The other one is that uh, there was a beautiful work by uh, Sels and Polkovnikov who say, well, so far all these works on counter diabetic driving assume that you are able to diagonalize the system Hamiltonian. And this, of course, as we already pointed out in 2012, is a killer for um, uh, quantum, uh, diabetic quantum computation and quantum annealing. And what they did is to uh, start to approximate the counter diabetic uh, control in a way that that, that you know, they introduce a, a, a different variation of population, which make no reference to, you know, removes the need to uh, uh, diagonalize the Hamiltonian you want to control. Uh, in such a way, they uh, pave the way to apply these shortcuts in a much broader way, uh, you know, in a much broader setting uh, in, in complex systems. And then what is remarkable is that, you know, in the last few years, there's been a huge explosion of protocols which combines counter reality driving with digital quantum simulation, and then they essentially apply it to everything you want. Yeah? So uh, I think one of the early works by, was by Marin Bukov, which was very insightful, and then there's a huge uh, amount of effort by Sitzen and Enrique Solano in Bilbao, where they, you know, they revisited quantum annealing, uh, quantum uh, approximate optimization algorithm, you know, other quantum optimization algorithms, and so on. So, uh, it, it, it is in, in some sense very amusing you know, to see something which was perceived as very crazy is becoming now uh, you know, a, a, a playing ground to develop new uh, quantum algorithms. So let, let me tell you a bit about how, how this comes about and how this is possible. Uh, <coughs> it essentially comes from the following observation. This is a, a, a technical slide, but it's actually simple. Yeah? Uh, you know, so fine, you know, we know from 2002 the works of the Park, Wright, and Beverly that you can uh, control a system and engineer shortcuts by counter reality driving if you are able to realize this, this monster Hamiltonian. Now, there's a beautiful uh, couple of works from the Boston University group, uh, uh, Peter Place and, and uh, Paul Kovnikov and so on, who realized, made, made a relatively simple observation. They said, look, this, this, uh, this, uh, this counter reality control, you can write it in terms of an interval which looks like this is the rate of change of your uh, Hamiltonian of interest, the one you, can, you want to control. You look at its, uh, the derivative with respect to the control parameter, the one that is changing. And now you go to, uh, I, well, I could have flipped the signs here. Ah, this is not the last slide. Uh, I didn't set the changes. Anyhow, but you go to a rotating frame with respect to the reference Hamiltonian. And you know, this looks completely formal, but now the interesting thing is that you can do baker hausdorff uh, expansion and uh, realize that the counter diabetic term really involves uh, only this set of operators. Our operators that are generated as commutators of the reference Hamiltonian times its uh, rate of change uh, will spread the parameter lambda. Yeah? So lambda could be the magnetic field in your uh, adiabatic quantum manila. Yeah? So, you know, so, so it's a set of nested commutators, and it's essentially without diagonalizing the system, you, we don't need to know what, what are the spectral properties of H naught. We can just uh, find an expansion of the constant diabetic control in terms, just by taking commutators. And taking commutators is very easy, so we very easily can identify what's the set of operators that help to suppress diabetic excitations um, in, in, in a general context. Okay, so with this now, uh, we can move to one of the examples which was uh, discussed, which is the digitized counter diabetic quantum approximate opti optimization algorithm. So, yeah, so there's the QAOA has been around for quite a while, and it's one of these hybrid classical quantum algorithms that relies on using a parameterized quantum circuit um, and classical optimization. Yes. 
So let's consider the case in which the quantum circuit is uh, describing essentially an annealing Hamiltonian, sorry for the typo, uh, where we go from, you know, we have a, a problem Hamiltonian for which we want to find, say, the final state, and we have some, some uh, mix of Hamiltonian. And uh, in general, you know, if we now think of a, a digital quantum simulation, we can uh, approximate the time evolution operator generated by this Hamiltonian uh, by a sequence of, uh, of gates, yes? So we discretize time, say, in p steps. So we have p steps for at different times. And at each step, you know, it may be that we need to approximate our h of a in terms of a set of uh, uh, gates uh, generated by uh, hm, yeah? So we have p time steps, and uh, for each step, we have m gates to approximate the uh, uh, instantaneous uh, time evolution operator. Now, so, so, so this is, you know, so, so uh, what the QAOA does then is to optimally, uh, you know, so, so we, we essentially break the unitary in terms of a product of unitaries, each of them with some coefficients, uh, beta and gamma. So what, these are the, the ones that are optimized classically, where after some fewer of merit, say the fidelity of preparing a given target state. And uh, what we do is, uh, you know, so we are able to implement the unitaries quantum mechanically, but uh, which coefficients we choose, we optimize classically, and we correct, the, essentially we, we update the circuit until we maximize some fewer of merit, uh, say the fidelity in preparing a target state. So that's standard QAOA, what we, I mean, B times QAOA, and what we want to do is to add, uh, increase the pool of operators uh, that go into this unitary, by adding the counter variabilitic terms. That now we will not aim at uh, realizing full adiabaticity, but we know, thanks to the works by Clay uh, and, and Paul Kopnikov and co workers, that uh, we can just introduce these operators as part of the uh, or, or those that are used to, uh, to, to design the gates. So we essentially add an extra unitary um, uh, which includes these, these operators. Uh, we, so, so this unitary will depend on some coefficients alpha, but we also optimize classically. Uh, but uh, even if it looks like we are adding uh, extra, extra rates, we are actually reducing effectively the number of uh, the depth of the circuit P. So that's the advantage of, of this technique. Um, so that's a bit uh, the idea of this digitized counter variabilitic QAOA. Um, we apply it to a bunch of optimization problems um, Classical optimization problems, uh, you know, transverse field icing model, longitudinal uh, field icing model, and so on. And in all of them, you know, this was uh, limited by our numerical uh, capability, uh, but in all of them, we saw that the digitized approach outperforms the conventional QAOA. So, you know, we will always have the green line for our um, uh, scheme uh, outperforming all, all the others, yes, uh, the traditional approach of QAOA. All right, so with this, I just want to close. I mean, we, we have seen um, the mechanism and physics beyond it. I introduced, uh, you know, I mentioned uh, we were we were able to prove uh, kibel in an open system for the first time. Uh, we also tested physics beyond kibel for the first time. Um, uh, then we introduced two approaches to do shortcuts in complex systems. One, based on local driving, requires very little information and somehow classically intuitive based on causality, from velocity versus sun velocity. And the other one is counter reality driving. It's much more quantum. Um, and you know, it was initially uh, required very complex Hamiltonians as controls. But we have seen that we can tailor this um, for you know, even for a spin glass. Yes, in principle. All right, so with that, that's all what I wanted to say. So uh, thank, thanks for your attention. try and disentangle the uh, microphones. Thank you very much, Adolfo. Very, very interesting talk. Excellent things, as always. Are there any questions for Adolfo? Well, I, sh I shall use Chairman's prerogative to ask a question then. So can you just go back to your, uh, maybe the very last data slide where you're looking at your QAOA with the CD uh, 
driving. Yeah, here we are. Okay, good. Uh, um, maybe a slide with data. This maybe the slide after this or. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So I guess there's there's a lot of stuff here. The number of layers is is the P in the QAOA. Exactly, exactly. Yes. Uh, but uh, uh, so, so what what sort of terms do you have in your um, counter diabetic part of the Hamiltonian? Uh, uh, I mean, you, you have K local terms, and how big is K? I guess is my question. So, so, so you know the, the way we we introduce them is. To this expansion. Uh -huh. yeah? so, so it depends on the system Hamiltonian we are choosing. For instance, say it's the easy model, yeah, in which uh, say only the magnetic field changes. So the derivative will only be that that couples to the magnetization. And then we uh, look at the commutator with the full Hamiltonian. So that will generate essentially a three body term, yeah, because we have a, a, a magnetization is local as the thermomagnetic uh, commutes with itself. So that goes to zero, but the other term that is non zero is the one. Magnetization times ferromagnetic interactions. Yeah? Okay. So that will be the first term. Yeah? Uh, when I look at the higher order commutators, this will again be, uh, uh, um, uh, they will be non local yeah? in the spin representation. But, but in, just to have understood in your numerics, the highest value, I mean, I guess L is equal to 3. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, oh, yeah, well, we, we could, yeah, so, uh, sorry, sorry, I, I don't have. I, let's see where I have details. I don't have details here. But essentially, yes, we are keeping L fixed, say maybe to 1 or to 2, and we are just increasing the P, the, the, the depth of the circuit, and seeing how it converges with this. But, 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 so I guess, again, from an experimentalist point of view, um, how, how far away are we from being able to implement these, these higher order terms? If, if it's, you know. Clearly, if it's a third-order interaction, that's a bit closer than if you need a seventh-order interaction, I guess. Well, well, but then you tropicalize it, yeah? You, you, okay. you break it into... Um, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I see. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Adrian. Thank you for that very nice talk. I, I had also kind of a general yeah, question. So, how, what is the connection between these enhancements and non-stochasticity? So is, is, there, is there something to be said about the fact that these Hamiltonians become more powerful be partially maybe because they are non-stochastic or...? Uh, yeah, I, I would expect this to work broadly. I don't think we are uh, constrained now by the kind of Hamiltonian, you know. So very early on we were very, you know, moving from single particle to <laughs> integral systems and so on. But by now, I think we, we can do this systematically for any for any system. Um, uh, our numerical simulations are very limited to a small system sizes, so you know it's a problem of scaling. And, and you know, so we, that's more or less where we stop. You know, it's just a, a dozen of qubits, so to speak. Uh, you know, so uh, I, I cannot. Uh, you know, one uh, would like to predict what's happening. Uh, uh, you know, for larger system sizes. Um, what we see is for you know with lower number of layers, so for in a NISC uh, kind of uh, setting, uh, we we perform well as you increase the number of layers. Uh, sometimes uh, you know you lost the advantage. Yes, so KOA becomes uh, not uh, you know equally competitive, so to speak. Um, yeah, that, that's as much as I can say. But you know there is no fundamental um, limitation in what kind of uh, system Hamiltonian you can consider here. The approach is universal. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, there's a question from Philip here. Hey, thanks for the talk. Uh, here I've got a, also a question related to your results comparing standard QIOA with this counter diabetic one. Uh, the results, I guess, that you demonstrated here are not normalized in terms of, you know, like the total number of parameters, depth of the circuit, and so on. So, like, w what is kind of justification of n comparing to, you know, different ansatzes uh, that have different structures, different expressibilities, and, you know, like, performance is also, uh, as you showed, slightly different. So, so we are increasing M and we are uh, uh, lowering P. Uh, so you know, so uh, um. yeah, like in the sense that, uh, like instead of using in a single layer of QAOA, you have a mixer 
that is parameterized by a single angle and then a phase separation that is also parameterized by a single angle. Here you ad uh, additionally add third small layer that is that has also a free parameter for the optimization. So like your two layers in total have six parameters, while two layers of QIA have only four variational parameters. That's right. And like, have you tried to compare it in some sort of normalized way per number of optimization parameter or per mm, depth of the circuit? Yes, I, well, and, I mean, so we, with the limit of small system sizes we have played with, yes, and uh, the answer is we, we love, are able to compete when the uh, depth is, you know, for shallow circuits, and it, in this case it's, it's preferable. So, so the results that you showed, like f on the next slide, for p equals to two, uh, in the uh, counter diabetic case, you have how many parameters? Six variational parameters. Possibly, yes. <laughs> yeah, I understand the question. Yeah. Um, uh, so, 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 you know, we are increasing the number of, you know, so we essentially have alpha, beta, only for QEOA, and yeah, now we put an alpha. Uh, but, you know, the overall, the, the, the question is that even if, even with fixing the total number of parameters, uh, the, this is uh, preferable uh, for shallow circuits. Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, Matthias, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, so it seems like you, well, if you, could you show the slide you just had with the equations? Sorry. <laughs> this one, exactly. Uh, if you truncate the CS expansion of the, of the counter diabetic terms, um, you, you, know, you get some, some approximation of the actual counter diabetic term. Um, but the quality of this approximation probably depends on this lambda parameter as well, right? Have you checked how far off you are, at, like, um, depending on, on lambda, yeah? Like yeah, yes, yes. So, so, of course, the quality uh, improves by increasing L, yeah? So it's a serious expansion, you can truncate it. Um, um, so, so w I, I, one of the things, you know, we did in the past, you know, this is this part that we did, discussion because we're, we're probably behind schedule a bit, which is my fault. I apologize. So let's thank Adolfo uh, once again. Thank you very much, Adolfo. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Oh,